Well, Montgomery from then on back had been a highly segregated environment. Blacks lived in one neighborhood, whites lived in others. There was no mixture of, of black and whites in the various neighborhoods, except where whites have blacks living in their yard as servants. That was the kind of mixture that you would find. Now, other than that, there was a sharp distinction between the activities of the blacks and the activities of the white. Blacks usually was a servant and do, did the labor. There were some few blacks did other things, such as uh, insurance and the business of that type, which did, dealt solely with blacks. As far as kids were concerned, there was no very few associations of black and white kids. I remember when I was a boy, going from off Gould Street over here to a Swain School, a Booker Washington School, many times white would wait for us and throw, us, throw rocks at us to run us out of the community. That happened frequently, but we got used to it and even changed our ways that we got rocks and threw back at them. So that was, that was a kind of a normal situation between black and white. They didn't work together except in areas where blacks and whites agreed on some things. Well, how well known I was and why, I guess it was because I was born here in Montgomery, right across town. Uh, I was an athlete in high school and in college. So playing football and baseball, especially if you're playing colleges or schools from other, other sections, you become fairly well known because athletics was very popular for us then. And I guess that was the beginning. Later on, I became interested in political activities. And uh, for some reason, I started working with voter registration. And I thought that was a, the finest thing I could have done. And I still believe that's the finest thing I've ever done, to help people get registered. And I did that as, as broadly as I possibly could. And that is the other thing that caused me to be known in Montgomery. Then following that, I coached football. And where people come to see Tuskegee and Alabama play, they're going to know the coach, you know. And that is the other thing that uh, caused me to be known in this area. I think those are the, some of the things. Well, uh, yes, in getting, in, 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 in encouraging people to get registered, you first have to get the registration blanks. So we had, we got a mimograph machine, had a little committee of us. We got a mimograph machine and we would get copies of the questions that the county would ask people to, to, to answer for registration. We had a large number of those printed, and we would take them in the community and let the people study them, and we'd go over it with them. So when they come to answer the question, they would know how to do it. And this, is, this, is, this was our method of registration. Then we had a projector showing blacks especially getting registered in certain areas. I think we got that, that, that film from the Labor Department. And we showed this in the various counties of the district. And this encouraged and inspired the people to become registered. They see other blacks getting registered and they were having fun doing it. And they wanted to emulate them. So that was some of the methods. Well, we had what was known as a citizens club. And it was, well, we did everything other clubs did. But in addition to that, we said you had to be a registered voter to be a member of the Citizens Club. Well, we had dances and we served drinks and this, that, and the other. But we didn't let people come in who were not members. 
if you want to become a member, and it was a popular club, <laughs> you would have to get registered. And that was a little scheme in which we used to get a number of people registered. I, I was uh, operating our, our own a citizens club. It was organized uh, with the effort in mind of getting people registered. We served drinks and we had dances, we had parties, we had a nice patio, and uh, in 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 getting people registered, we invite different clubs to come in, and we would have registration forms for them to fill out. Would show them how to fill them out and 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 uh, show them. And sometime we would take them to the courthouse to get registered if they come in groups. So this this was some of the things we did at the Citizen Club. Now Reverend King came into the Citizen Club to talk to various groups, not only about registration, about other things, uh, family problems, and he was very helpful. And, and, and helping the citizens in that area with his conferences. But he had regular conference in the in a room we call the, uh, I can't recall now what we call the room, but it's a, a, a room which was set aside for him to have conferences with the citizens. Yes, it was a surprise to some people but it was an excellent thing to others to know what he was doing. Now, he didn't participate in the uh, 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 drinks of that sort at all, but he did make good close contact with the people who came in there, and especially those special groups who, who came in there to hear what he had to say. The most effective reason they would have is that if you miss any single question, any, any unimportant uh, 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 answer, you were turned down. And that was the reason why we had to get the registration forms and get mimographs and machines to mimograph a large number of them so that our people wouldn't miss a single question. Now, some of the questions were not important at all. But if you missed the question, you were denied. And that was the reason that we went into this getting as prepared as we possibly could to, to answer the questions. And we did a fairly good job because we studied them as thoroughly as we could. The people who went down then to register, they knew the questions because they studied them carefully and uh, many times I would take them down there and wait for them and bring them back. Now if they didn't get registered then we would send a, a complaint to the to the governor. It was not only getting people registered here in Montgomery County I went to the uh, 13 counties in the 2nd Congressional District to get people registered. And that, that took quite a, quite a job, but it was just a joy to me because I could do it and sometimes would have people, persons go with me and sometimes I wouldn't. But I had the means by which to go to these various counties. And we set up meetings in the churches or wherever we could set up meetings. And the people would be there when I got there. I would come with a stack of registration forms, pass them out, go over the questions with them, and see to it that they answered all the questions uh, correctly. Then we would make some plans to go to the courthouse to get registered. And in, in, in instances, I would take some of them to the courthouse. That was the procedure was, that was used throughout the 2nd Congressional District. Now, I, I guess that accounts for my being known throughout the, the, the area and throughout the district. I don't think it was a difficult task if such and such a church would permit us to have a registration meeting in that church we would ask all the people who wanted to get registered to meet at the same time. 
we would go there with the registration forms and pencils and pass those applications out, take one and go over it with the group, being sure that they didn't miss a single question, and therefore let them fill it out there, let them study it and set a time when they would go to the courthouse for registration. Now we do this this church one Sunday or whatever in one night and go to another church, another who want to get registered. Now we when one or two people get registered, that's gonna inspire some of the others. And we have less difficulty in in getting them together because it, it becomes a kind of a little game then and they like it. Uh, Miss Parks was a kind of a quiet woman, apparently a quiet woman, but she had a, a, a motive, a, a motivation in her that you didn't see right off. And it takes, it takes some pushing to get her motivated. But her appearance and what was within her was two different things. She looked like a very quiet and peaceful woman, and she acted like that in most instances. But there were some things that disturbed her greatly, and I think this this matter of riding the bus <coughs> uh, just went right to her heart, so to speak. And then she's not a quiet woman; she's an outspoken uh, a person. Yes, I think I can describe the bus system that upset Mrs. Park because I've been here all my life. And uh, the segregated bus system operated that when blacks wanted to get on the bus, they would enter a, a kind of a back or side door getting in. And they would sit from the back about halfway or as much as they could near halfway from the back to the front. Whites get on, they get on the front of the bus, they would sit from the front to midway the back or as much as they need to, much seating as they needed. So that was the situation that exists and had been existing for years. The blacks get on in the back and the whites get on in the front. The blacks sit down from the back up and the whites sit down from the front back. Now that was not the law except that was what they insist that you must do. And uh, I think this was a, a undesirable thing for some people because they figured if they pay their fare, they ought to be able to sit in where they want to. And I think this was the feeling of Mrs. Parks when she got on the bus. She didn't go to the back. She got on at the front and she went through the front in a certain area and sit down in the front area, front, front section. And the bus driver ordered her up. And this is when she refused to get up because she figured she paid her fares and she had a right to sit in where she wanted. That uh, is the way I see the bus situ situation during that time. What kind of man Martin Luther King was and how I become to nominate him for the chairmanship of the MIA. Well, Martin Luther King was a young man. I was quite a bit older than Martin Luther King when he was a pastor, when he became a pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. But Martin Luther King was a, a forthright man he you could you could feel what he said as well as hearing what he said he he looked like he talked from the heart and he was sincere about his his uh, 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 his sermons or whatever he was talking about he was a good man he was a smart man he was highly educated and in that from that uh, background he was more effective in influencing people than, than, than anybody we had in the group at that time, and especially for the MIA, because 
here you need to have somebody who can influence the public, who can influence small groups. And Martin Luther King just was ideal for that sort of a thing. That's why I nominated him. There were some others who wanted to be the chairman, but they did not have the ability. They didn't. They had the desire, but that was all. But Martin Luther King, as quietly as he was, he had all that was necessary, it seemed to me, to be the chairman. And for that reason, I nominated him first because I didn't want the whole thing to be cluttered up with so many others who didn't have the the, the background and the experience or the uh, knowledge in dealing with people. I couldn't answer that for others, but I believe people just knew him and 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 his expression convinced him that he could do the job more effectively than anybody else, it seemed, anybody else in our group, it seemed. And there was no question about opposition after he was nominated. That that was important because it wouldn't be out of this group or out of that group and that group or this group would feel they had a, an advantage over the others. But he was a neutral man, a good man, and a man that could do the job and a man that was not on this side or that side. I think that was the reason. Yes, I think it was a special talent he had. He could talk to people. People believed him. He was honest. He was sincere. He, he could talk their language, but he could talk the language of uh, any other group. And he was convincing in his conversation. It, it wasn't a make-believe. He was sincere, and you could feel it. And, and you, could, you could go with King in him wherever he went. It's, it's very hard for an uh, ordinary person to describe Reverend King's speaking ability because he was such an outstanding man. He could, he could, he, he could make you feel what he was saying as well as hearing what he was saying. He was sincere and dedicated, and he could lift you out your seat. You, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't just be quiet and look like it was such a stirring thing that it would affect you. It just go right through you. So I can't I can't say much more than that, but because it is so, such a stimulating thing, and he was carried away, look like with his own speech. He 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 couldn't be quiet. He had to speak. It was something in him that had to come out and had to be known by the people, and he would tell them in such an effective way. To 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 describe Reverend King's speaking ability, you'd have to be Reverend King. I can't do that. To talk about the jealousy some people felt about King is a difficult thing to do because King was, was highly enlightened, had superb ability with the English language, and there was not many ministers in our area who could come up to that height. And I'm sure that there were some who were jealous from that point of view, and some that were fairly close to him wanted to have this sort of position in the community but did not have what it took. And therefore, it is easy to see how they would be a little jealous because here is the man coming out of another city or town or state, coming into Montgomery and taking the leadership and in inspiring and moving people into action where, where they have been here for years and have not had that opportunity or had that ability to do this sort of a thing. So that is the kind of thing you can imagine the jealousy came from, but whatever it was, King had what it took to move Montgomery and the nation, I believe. 
Well, I can probably tell you more about the Transportation Committee and the working of it because I was the chairman of the Transportation Committee, and I think I was made chairman because I had access to cars at the fuel home. When, when, when we needed cars, I could get a car right then and go and do what was necessary. But to organize the transportation was a much bigger job because we had to get cars for the entire community sometime, and cars that would be sent to certain areas in the community. Therefore, we we asked for persons who had cars and would voluntarily put them in the transportation pool to let us know and wh what time they could be used. And in that way, we could know when we would have cars and where they had to go to pick up people. So the, 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 the people who had work, who worked in the various outlying areas of the city would register their place of regist uh, 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 working and the time that they would get off and where they would be to, for cars to pick them up. And this is the type of arrangement we had a committee working on to be able to pick up the people when they get off of work now. We had several people in, in one area to be picked up. Uh, a couple of cars would do that. Several people in another area, a couple of cars would do that. And at a certain time, this is the general idea and the way the Transportation Committee was set up. And those folks who had cars would register them in the pool and the, the register the time that they would be usable. And from that, we could serve the people. The Transportation Center was a place, a vacant lot downtown, or rather a parking lot downtown that we were able to use for the cars that came from the various sections of the county, I mean the city or the county. They would bring all the people in that area and, and uh, they would make the transfer. Some people coming from North Alabama had to go to East Alabama and would bring them all in and get them reclassified uh, uh, as far as the direction in which they were going and send them on home. Now that was our, our main uh, uh, headquarters down in the heart of Montgomery. Yes, yes, we, this is, this is, this is the way we would know that the people had to be picked up. People would call in and say, I'm out here on Cloverdale Road in such and such a block, and I'm, I'll am i be ready at such and such a time. But this was, this was being done all through the day, and we would know what time they were supposed to be picked up and where they were. Then we, when we bring them to the center, then all of those people who lived in North Montgomery would get into a car and they'd take care to their place in North Montgomery. So that was the way of operating. It's it's hard for me to try to guess now. I, I, an idea, we had, I suppose, around 25 or uh, 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 30 cars or more. It's hard to know because if my car could be used today at such and such a time, and another, and my car may not be able to be used tomorrow at that time. Don't you see? And and the cars that come in who volunteer or uh, put their cars in for service wouldn't do it. Some of them couldn't do it uh, uh, day by day, but they could do it as their conditions permitted them. Therefore, we couldn't say exactly how many cars because it varies as to the number of cars within the carpool. We had a considerable number, however. Well, the reason I believe that the city was slow, Reverend King was such a forceful influence for right. He was such a forceful influence for doing away with the, with the segregation system in the city until they didn't want to deal with him. Uh, 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 he was just too straightforward for them. I think that was the main reason. He was too intelligent. He was too courageous. He was w always willing to 
to make whatever commitment he had to make for right. I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. Because they couldn't see how the whole Negro group, so to speak, would rally around a man as young as Reverend King. But Reverend King was a different man. He had what was necessary to corral people, and he had the spirit to do it, and the and knowledge and the intelligence to do it. I don't know whether you even think about being discouraged. If you hear Reverend King talk, if you get into the conversation or into the meetings or into the services, you are inspired. You, you're, not, you're not discouraged. The job may be extremely difficult, but you are inspired to do it irrespective of the difficulty. He was, he was a character that stimulated and moved people. And you can see that he, he has moved the country. When King House was bombed, it, it affected the whole black community because they, 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 they acted as though their house was bombed and the uh, crowds of people gathered right down the street here where he lived uh, uh, as soon as they heard it. It was a mass of people in the street. That's the way they responded to him. Now, King had to come out to tell them that his wife and children were safe and they could go home. But but they didn't respond to that. They they wanted to do something to 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 make amends for for someone bumming his house or bum somebody else's house because his was bummed. That was the way they felt. But he quieted them down and told them that nobody was hurt. His children were well, his wife was not hurt, he was not hurt, and later on during the night, they gradually went back home. No, no, no. They want to get revenge, but King had to get that out of their system. It made them cling to King more tenaciously. <laughs> you you feel that you have accomplished something, you know. I remember, you see the bus go right down the street there, going right to the college. And the, when the bus boycott was over, the people just, the blacks got on the bus to sit on the front seat just to, just, just to, just to show home. <laughs> and they had a lot of fun sitting on the front seat riding, riding to to the college or riding away from the college. Nobody sat in the back then because all of them sat on the front. <laughs> it, was, it was a jubilation. It was a joy. You, you, how can black people be any different from black people in other places? Look at my black and your black. We about the same black. Now, what's gonna make me so much different from you? And the only thing I can see is the type of pressure being put on me that may not be put on you that would make me respond in a more vigorous way. But now, all blacks are seg uh, uh, subjected to certain sort of a way of life. I wouldn't say all, but very near all. Now, I, I, Montgomery's the heart of Alabama. Alabama's a southern town. Segregated, been segregated as long as I can remember. And much longer. We had a type of leadership that inspired people to strive for what would do them and what was right. And that leadership was more forceful and more penetrating 
than the, than the, what you could find in some of the other places. And I think that was the cause of Montgomery being a little different in reacting to the situation than some of the other places. That's what I think. I think Dr. King was different because he had something in him that that made him different. He he had to almost save the blacks in the community from from being misused, so to speak. He was just a different man. He was highly intelligent, as religious and straightforward as any man I've ever known. And he could inspire people to do many things they thought they would not do. This is the difference, I think, in Reverend King. He was ambitious, but not in acquiring wealth. He was ambitious to inspire and to lead and to open the way for people. He was ambitious for people's development. He was ambitious for knowledge of, uh, 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 of people in situations where they need change. This was the kind of ambition that he had. He wasn't after wealth at all. He was after the soul of man. And he, he could change whites just as he could change black if they would listen to him. And this is the thing that disturbed the whites because they knew he was making changes and they didn't want changes. That was his ambition. Yes, I think Dr. King changed many whites. But there were also changes on both sides. Those who want to keep the situation as it were, they were radical. They, 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 they went the other way. Don't you see? He was too much of a force. If you had to go with him or you had to go against him. And many of the whites went against him. There were some who went with him. 